So uh, we're going to get to welcome, so we're going to get the panel to introduce himself. My name is Adam Philthorpe. I am Director for External Affairs at BCS, it says here. And uh, what we're going to talk about is the Great Workforce Challenge, Recruitment, Training and Retention to Drive Forward Digital Transformation. Um, two things on this to start. The first is I am a director on the Federation of Informatics Professionals, so I have a real interest in this space myself. So I'm not a health and social care professional. I am interested, though, in the rise of digital talent, how we nurture it, how we grow it, how we seed that, but also how it comes in and out of the NHS at various different levels. In setting up FedIP, what I learned was the first most important lesson I learned was that the NHS, I rather naively thought, was one organization. I've learned that you are eight and a half thousand different organizations all at war with each other over budget. Now, that was a very important contextual constraint that I needed to understand to really make sense of some of the stuff that's happening around digital talent. So it was quite funny to begin with, but got quite serious very quickly, certainly when the pandemic struck and people started to realize that they could do digital, but the demands of digital changed um, massively. The last thing I'd say about that by way of introduction is I'm a true believer in technology, but I'm a true believer in technology because it matters to people and because it has a massive hopeful promise on the impact of people. I'm not into technology because I like boxes with lights on. I'm into technology because I really like people and what it can do for them. So I'm here to make sure really that technology delivers on its hopeful promise. So what does that mean? It means that everyone who's a professional and the people we're going to talk about and the talent that we want to come in, they are trying to make good on that hopeful promise. And to do that, you need critical thinking. Hope without critical thinking is just naivety. But critical thinking without hope is just cynicism. So what we're going to discuss is how we get to that balance across the piece. We want to make good on the hopeful promise of digital health and social care and the transformative benefit to patients and humans more generally. Before we get into that, I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves, perhaps less flowery than I just have, um, and a little bit more meaningfully. So if I can ask Martin at the end there to introduce himself. It's going to be tricky to rival that introduction, so I'll just go for the next 20 minutes about myself and my career <laughs> history. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm the Director of Digital Transformation and Deputy CDIO at Midlands Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. So at Midlands Partnership, we're a large-scale community trust specialising in mental health, physical health and special, um, specialist services in dental, learning disability, forensics, sexual health services, drug and alcohol services. The reason why I'm listing all these is because digitally and from a workforce point, workforce point of view, it's very diverse landscape. We're up and down the country, we've got 125 sites, over 10,000 staff. Um, it is a significantly varied landscape, lots of different digital systems, lots of different skill sets required and lots of different services that need to be delivered for health and social care and the specialist services area. So from a digital workforce perspective, really passionate about this area because we have to tailor and focus our efforts differently depending on what services we have. So, yep, nice to meet you all, and don't ask too many difficult questions. <laughs> Yinka is up for those questions, she said. Yinka, would you like to do an introduction? Yeah, thank you. Um, good. Are we still morning, afternoon? Um, I'm Yinka. I'm the Director of Digital Workforce at NHS England. Um, so, my interest in this area is that I've been in digital health, um, health tech, since 2004. Um, in many different roles, delivery roles, uh, business development roles, uh, program management roles, and, and now um, in charge of developing a strategy. But one thing that's always been consistent is that as a sector, I think we get very, very excited about the technology. And, uh, and the focus has often been about the technology. But we've always forgotten about the people and what it takes to actually deliver these things sustainably. And that's been a, co a consistent theme over those, as, over those many years. So um, I'm really passionate, but also very interested and, and keen that we shift that and, and shift the mindset around what do we need to do to um, make sure that we're well-resourced, well but 
but also that we're building a workforce that can support the digital transformation ambitions of the sector. Perfect, thank you. And last but not least, let's have Mark. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Hutchinson. I'm the CIO at Gloucestershire Hospitals NHS Trust. I've been CIO in four different acute um, hospitals over the last 20 years. And I guess over the last 12 and last three organisations have implemented an electronic patient record across you know, three large acute hospitals really successfully. And my observation during that journey is that while um, uh, there's, a, there's a few of us, some of whom are in this room, uh, who have been really successful at that and who understand that really well, as, as we've moved from project to project and from organisation to organisation, over the course of that decade, it's become harder and harder to recruit the, the skills uh, that you need to be able to you know, successfully implement clinical systems, uh, to build the infrastructure upon which those systems need to sit, uh, the, the architecture and the integration necessary to surface all of that clinical information. And that while, as we'll get into it, uh, you know, opportunities like remote working that have come out of the pandemic should make it easy for us to recruit, mm -hmm. it's also made it easier for us to leak staff uh, to other organisations. And so I'm really interested in this because we've learned loads as a, as a sector and as an NHS about how to successfully implement you know, big uh, clinical change programmes that have been digitally enabled, but we are, if we're not very <coughs> careful, going to be hamstrung massively by uh, the lack of uh, available talent in the, in the NHS, and we need to work out how we're going to address that. Okay, well, let's go straight in. And so why, why has it been so difficult? Over the last 10 years, you said it's been very difficult to increasingly difficult to, to get the talent in. Why has that been the case? Can you point at reasons? Well, it might just be me. <laughs> <laughs> you might just not want to work for me. Um, uh, yeah. But I don't think it's all that. Uh, I think there's a, a combination of reasons, isn't there? I think we, we don't do a great job uh, of um, uh, you know, paying people compared to uh, other markets. Uh, but I also think we don't do a very good job articulating what we're here to do. Uh, I don't think we do a very good job of explaining that um, we aren't just about making sure that the computer works on the ward clerk station and the printer works in, uh, in the procurement department. I don't think we do a very good job explaining that. Whatever your skill set and whatever your interest, if you come and join our team, we can help improve the safety and the reliability of patient care by implementing digital solutions. I don't think we do a very good job of articulating how you can literally impact the care of thousands of patients every day if you join with us with um, you know, implementing um, your systems that bring about real change in, in hospitals. And I, think, and, and I think if you are already an IT professional looking for a job, you probably don't go to NHS jobs first. Yeah. Okay, <coughs> uh, but then surely everything I read about generations coming through and new motivations and people are working are talking about values-led. Yeah. Surely there can be no greater <laughs> values-led or purpose-driven organization than those engaged in the public task. And I'd include the public sector in that, as well as particularly the NHS. Do you, do you see that in the conversations you have with trying to get talent in? Uh, I see that in conversations um, across our organisation. You know, we've, we've pulled people from all sorts of different departments, and you see that in conversations with people who absolutely are in the private sector one-on-one. -on -one. But I don't see anybody facilitating that conversation nationally. I don't see um, local organisations necessarily uh, being flexible enough to have those conversations um, because people don't know to <coughs> listen when the NHS is speaking. But absolutely, when you go and speak to individual people, you can see that um, you know, there, there is a generation who want to help um, improve, you know, improve care. Okay, so, right. So, Mark, how do we, how do we get those people? If there, there is a people who are purpose-led and values-driven, we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. this. Sometimes purpose can be a bit of a privilege, can't it? Because you need to get subsistence before you can have that. So, you know, gas bills are rising, this is true. So, in that context, well, there, is a, there is a hook in there. What, what are the challenges are there, apart from motivating, we're getting people into, into this industry and getting people into the NHS specifically? I think, I think one of the biggest challenges are, well, is, is that our, our job descriptions are terrifying. I think if you look on NHS jobs, we've done well because suddenly someone's heard about NHS jobs. That's brilliant. All right, they're already there. We've got them. They've just got to click on the apply button now, and then they click that job description and personal specification. Well, and that X button has been pressed quicker than anything because the 
there's about five pages of narrative. It reads as if you've got to know everything about every clinical system that you've got. In our organization, as I said, very diverse in our clinical systems. We've got a lot of them. And our job descriptions really do terrify people. So they might have that sense of purpose. I did when I joined the NHS in 2008. But I was terrified because of, I thought, am I going to be able to stack up and meet this because I don't have experience in this sector? I moved from private IT to public sector IT because I was driven to do something more than fund the people's profits in my private IT company I was working in in Dorset. But on the first few weeks, I was terrified about my ability to really add value to the health and social care sector I was working within. Then you learn and you build your experience and you get that. But that initial job description, when I looked at it, I thought, I don't know if I'll be able to do this. And that's what the general public find. I think that's what we do. But we are hampered by the job description process, which is agenda for change, and it has to lead these certain standards to be against certain bandings. So we really, we've got to do a lot of work, I think, with how we, how we advertise our positions, how we make them look appealing, but how we also make them look achievable and not terrifying. And I think that's, that's how we put that narrative in the application process to say, this is what we can offer. We can offer flexible work in upskilling, mentoring, in addition to all of the requirements. We're very good at listing what we need people to do. We're not particularly good at listing how we can help people to do it. And how do we... So, so hearing you speak, we know that you're, you're passionate about this and we've, we've <coughs> met and I know that you're, you're good at what you do. But how do we display that and demonstrate that? If someone who's in your position, who's mm. achieved the levels of understanding and impact that you have, yeah. how do we know that? What, what systemically is in place for you to be able to demonstrate and project that knowledge and to be able to draw people to you? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think what's in place, well, events such as this, where we can yeah. talk about it and swap notes. If you've got time to come here. If we've got you time under, to come under here. pressure back, back at the ranch. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are you Yinka? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I guess we've got a couple of hospitals, but they're probably quite busy, right? Uh, yeah, 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 okay. Fair enough. You've made a good point. Can I just get up yeah. my emails? Is that okay? <laughs> so you've made a really good point. Um, yeah, so you do need to build capacity as a leader to say, actually, you know, we need to have the confidence to stop and sharpen the axe. And some, some of that is actually going out to local colleges, universities, building that local networking and saying, this is what we're all about. These are the opportunities. Like final year projects. Back, back before the pandemic, we were doing final year projects with the local universities that were really interested in engaging their students in trying to do health and social care focused final year projects. It was a wonderful scheme. And then the university lecturer got made redundant. And then COVID hit. And we've not had the capacity to re-engage in that network. But things such as that, in addition to the apprenticeships that we're working on, those are the areas where actually having leaders such as Mark and myself in the provider world to actually go and take the time to build those networks and talk to people on a, on a human <coughs> personal level rather than taking just the digital element of the application process out of it and convincing people that this is achievable, it's interesting, and there's a really good role to be had. Yeah, I think that's I what needs to happen. Can I come in? I'm, so com I'm coming so to you now, Yinke. We've go. Got, so we've done, we've done a lot of primary research on this over the last six months. Um, so we know that uh, we, did, we did a call for evidence um, and we got probably about 300 to 400 responses to that. 52% of respondents said that they have difficulty attracting and recruiting um, digital data and technology staff. And 36% said it was extremely difficult. And then 34% said that they have difficulty retaining staff. So that was the call for evidence. <coughs> Excuse me. More recently, we've just completed um, uh, 16 workshops across all the regions of the country um, to develop the National Digital Workforce Plan. And you're right, so some of the themes that were coming out of that were um, there's no presence in universities. Students don't even know that they can have a career in the NHS. Mm -hmm. We're just not there. We're not there doing the job fairs, doing the milk rounds, we're not there, so they don't even know that they, they could have a career in the NHS, uh, in health and social care. Um, number two, when they get to NHS jobs, if they manage to get to NHS jobs, the process is horrendous. I mean, I tried to, I pretended to apply for a job last week, and it was the number of steps that you have to go through is 
is the first hurdle. It will put anyone off mm. if they are just considering the NHS. They haven't quite committed to it, but they are open to exploring it. Mm. We will lose them at the first hurdle. And then obviously once we get them in, the challenge that for retaining them is the lack of a, a career pathway. So we don't have a consistent career pathway or career offer for um, people who have decided that they want to, on purpose, work for the health and social care sector. But we are not giving them exciting career opportunities where they can grow and develop. And so they will be tempted to leave to go to industry for higher, 20, 20,000 pound more in salary. I guess one of the challenges there is we don't want to be, on one hand, in digital, because di digital is a relatively immature profession, mm. right? So. We don't want to be too prescriptive because some of those pathways are evolving and de developing right now, and we don't know what you know. I don't know what job descriptions might be available to, to if, if people have children in school now, what jobs they might be applying for when they it could be completely different to what it is now. But by the same token, we want to supply people with support, whether that's learning and development, whether that's registration, whatever it might be, to, to help enable them through their career. And I guess that's what you're trying to do right yeah. now, isn't it? It's trying to understand that between being prescriptive, but also allowing innovation and change yeah. as part of that role. And that seems to me the fundamental um, challenge in the private sector as well, the public sector, is that, you know, um, good digital is keeping the lights on to some people, but good digital to other people is about the people, processes, and business models of the post-internet era, which is about not keeping the lights on, but actually changing the light, you know, ripping the organization to shreds, having the, the seeds of your own destruction, capability-wise, in-house, rather than having it outside, either competing with you, or outside in the public task, where you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we grow our own? Because we know that we're challenged when it comes to pen remuneration and other aspects, even if people are well motivated. How do we grow our own talent within the NHS? number of channels. Should I start? Yeah, yeah. You mentioned one, apprenticeships. Mm. Um, as a sector, I don't think we are fully utilising the levy. We know that there are reasons for that, the apprenticeship levy, there are reasons for that. Uh, we're here. Um, anecdotally, there are challenges around um, <coughs> supporting apprentices once they come into the organisation. So one of the conversations we're having at NHS England is around, is there anything that we can do either at the centre or regionally, um, potentially through um, the ISDN network, potentially, to um, support apprentices at the start of their journey so that it makes it an easier transition once they get into a provider organisation. So we've got apprenticeships and we can do so much more with apprenticeships. And apprenticeships aren't just new people coming into the sector, they're people who are already in the system who we want to upskill into new roles as well. Um, graduates is another great opportunity, so we are already le uh, um, leading a national DDAT uh, graduate scheme. Um, <coughs> we've got a huge amount of uh, demand from provider organisations, particularly those trusts at the moment who are implementing EPR programmes. But there's lots of other opportunities for graduates to move into the sector. Um, and then the other area is I talked about upskilling, but there's the reskilling as well. So you can look at roles which are potentially going to become more obsolete over the coming years um, and look to see how you can move those um, uh, that, that component of the workforce into new emerging roles. Okay. But do we need to be more radical? There's there's a um, there's a there's an opportunity, I think. So post post pandemic, people understand we used to have to fight to say that we were relevant, that digital had a, a meaningful kinetic impact on the running of a hospital. It was still, we were getting there, but it was still quite hard fought to have that conversation at a leadership level. I think we've, we've won, hooray, we've won that argument sort of post-pandemic that actually people understand the importance of digital, not just in running something, but actually in transforming it into something fit for the future. Mm. With those sorts of pressures, and with the pressures that we have where people who really get that can go and work for Google, what else do you think we need to do to grow our own talent? I think there's something about scale, isn't there? So what the uh, Northwest Informatics Skill Development Network was able to do was recruit one or two 
uh, informatics graduate trainees every year. Um, and I'm going back five or six, seven years. I've worked with a few of those people who've gone on to have you know, really great NHS careers. Um, they, have be, they were brilliant uh, individuals and it was a brilliant source of talent. I guess I reflect on the fact that um, we're an organisation that employs more than a million people. We're the biggest employer in Western Europe. There's 80 digital vacancies just in my organisation and we're getting two informatics graduate trainees to cover a quarter of the country. Mm. And I, I think there's something about scale and ambition. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I don't know the number of uh, people who graduate this, uh, you know, this coming summer, but it'll be, you know, hundreds of thousands. What, you know, how many are we wanting to try and attract? How many uh, uh, vacancies have we got for informatics graduate trainees? Because I think, I think that is, would, would be a really good way to go, but we need to somehow match the size of the organisation, the size of the digital skills gap with kind of the, 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 the available uh, vacancies and work out how we can find more, um, more funding or more opportunities or just a better route to be able to provide that level of, of support. And then we, we talk consistently, th th there's also a short term challenge here, isn't there? While people have got great ideas about how we tackle this in the medium term, in the, in the short term we've all got vacancies, we've all got challenges and we all want to, to have people who've got the right sets of values. And, and, and those values are found in the hospital you know, we, we have routinely gone about um, kind of attracting people from other teams. We've had people from the patient advice and liaison team. We've had a couple of people from the communications team. We've had people out of finance and ple employed people who previously worked in the laundry. You know, the people who have gone to the, the NHS have decided to build a career there and be able to explain to them how if you come and join us, you don't just get to you know, have an impact on your little bit of the world. You can have an impact on all 1,000 patients every day. Mm. And so unashamedly, go and identify the people in your own organisation who've got you know, all, all, all the values and who want to be part of bringing about you know, really significant organ, organisational wide change. Yeah, because you, you've got to look after graduates and apprenticeship because it's, it's, it's a great routine. Mm. But I, I remember talking to the DWP. They were looking for... Um, well, they were looking for people who were brilliant at uh, uh, customer journey, digital customer journeys. The trouble is if you go and DWP and you're better than most, if you go to the job centre, there aren't a load of digital people waiting to be drawn down, right? Mm -hmm. So our graduates, are, they are very finite and quite a small pool. It's growing, actually, the number of people doing computer science and they're becoming more diverse and this is all to the good. There's a long time to wait for that to solve the problem. DWP realized that they actually they had loads of really amazing digital customer journey people. They were all sat in customer service because these were people who could make it, who knew just by an area code what sort of conversation they were about to have and what the outcome was likely to be and how they can interject and help. So they actually just said, right, we've got customer journey people. Just they need to be included in every digital meeting we have about customer journey. So I think that's good. You're showing a, a similar sort of ambition. You can find people from, and we need to be open-minded, I think, enough to see that there's talent exists in many forms. Yeah. Mm. If we just go for those, those specific people, hi, I've got a degree in computer science and an interest in healthcare, mm. you know, well, they're going to get, you know, Google are going to come for them, aren't they? So it's, yeah. it's how, how do we engender those sorts of programs? How do you s sort of make that more systematic? Yeah, I think, so I think this is where competencies come in because if you're clear about what competencies um, uh, are needed to do a job, then that opens up a market. You mm. don't have to go to the obvious people that have done computer science, right? There are probably other um, people with other skills that have done other courses, uh, that haven't gone to university, we shouldn't just focus on university graduates, where people have those competencies or they have seeds of those competencies and we can develop those, we can nurture those people and start to develop a pipeline, uh, you know, start to, to bi build a pipeline. Yeah. I, I, I wonder, y you described the job description at the beginning as being kind of overfacing. That's because the job description was written to tick some agenda for change boxes in yeah. a desperate attempt to get it banded properly. Yeah. Um, as I don't know how many of us on this stage, but certainly I've not got a degree. I suspect I couldn't get most of the jobs working for me. Um, if it was done on the basis of you know, the, the person spec and the job description that's been written. But what you actually want is yeah, a, a, the right set of values, but, but also an understanding of uh, you know, patient flows, a, a, a big lump of common sense, 
<laughs> uh, and a desire to improve mm. the experience for the patient. And all the rest we can train. Yeah. But and if you put that in a job description, it would come out as a banding that we'd never be able to recruit to. Okay. That's it. I was going to say, and use those apprenticeship levies, so actually being mindful about all those opportunities, so the Midlands Digital Skills Network, the apprenticeship levy where you can use your funding, so there's a gentleman on the front row that's worked in our department who was a success of the apprenticeship levy and got an MBA from it. Um, but one of the key areas, and he'll attest to, I'll get him on stage in a second, um, <laughs> one of the key areas, I think, around ret retaining staff that I've seen the biggest differentiator for it People always say that you don't leave a bad job, you leave a bad manager. And retaining staff and being empowered to maximise the opportunity from all of these offers is only as good as the leadership at all levels within the digital teams. So the apprenticeships, we've, we've, got, we've had some successful apprenticeship journeys that have gone straight from apprenticeship level right now to senior project manager level at Band 7. Fantastic programme manager does not have the capacity with the demand on him right now to take on any more apprentices because of the demand is so high. We need to do our EPR convergence. We need to do the other 30 projects we've got to deliver this year. I just don't have the time to invest in more apprentices at the minute. I need people that are ready now, that can deliver this program now, that can meet that national objective now. We've got to be HIMSS level five by 2025. I don't need apprentices. I need people that can do the job. So we need that leadership to have the strength and the capacity released to invest in the talent that's needed now. And the middle managers make that time because even with the apprenticeship levy, you should be releasing days per week. And Colin, I'm sure you were released some time in the week, I hope. <coughs> but the pressure cannot be ignored. Yeah. That the, when, you do, when you take on board some of these skills opportunities, yeah. which will improve retention because you get free qualifications and you get free upskilling, it adds pressure to the individual because the day job isn't stopping and backfill isn't happening consistently enough. So we have to be supportive. How do we do that? Oh, Sorry, I've lost it. Well, you go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about how busy we all are. I think this is where I need to leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do we do it? So again, it is around ruthless prioritization of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. We talk about keeping the lights on. We talk about how much we're transforming. Everything that we're transforming right now needs digital to some degree. But we don't often say what we're not going to do. So this year, we've been talking about how much we're not going to do to release that capacity. So at an exec level, they're really focused on digital MPFT. It's fantastic. But some of the objectives of this year as a leadership team are to address the vacancy rate increase the amount of transformation we're doing, meet the national standards and the new sequins that have come back in and the CIP targets that have come back in because of financial austerity, and to reduce the amount of agency spend that we're having. They're all pulling in different directions and opposing directions. So the one thing that we have to do is ruthlessly prioritize business as usual. What do we need to do to keep people safe, to improve care, to deliver our services? And what do we need to do to transform that's the most important for this next 12 months, both regulatory requirements and quality and value-adding improvements in health and care, and give ourselves some capacity with what we don't do to d invest in such important things as our workforce. So we've won a, a transformation through, through the pandemic, let's say. That has that won us a significant amount of leverage when it comes to talking to senior, senior leadership at a national level about our importance and therefore these issues? Do you, feel, do you feel that that's in the water or is that a myth? I think it did give us some leverage, but I wonder, uh, we have short memories really, um, and you know, when we get back, now that we're sort of back to normal almost, um, we've got to get on with the job. Uh, we've got even more pressures than we had before COVID. And there's are almost a risk in that we've sort of gone back to the old way of thinking. I was going to say, yeah. so are, are some yeah. of those pressures that those that have adopted and, and have embraced the sort of digital revolution, if you like, in, yeah. in health and social care, that puts even more pressure on your teams. Yeah. But has the capacity been increased as a result of that? There's more pressure and an awareness, but mm. or is it just more pressure? I don't think the capacity has been increased, but I know that there's now a realisation that we do need to increase capacity. 
I think that's the difference that I've observed. Okay. Yes. And so we're all sort of scrambling to try and meet that need. I'm talking about workforce. We're now scrambling to try and meet that need very quickly. Okay. To deal with the immediate pressures. Mm. Do you concur with that? Do you feel that? Uh, I'm not sure it necessarily feels like that on the, you know, in, in an acute hospital. Um, there's a few people uh, shaking their head. Uh, you know, we, we, um, it, it's, it's beginning to feel, mm. as it always did, you know, um, please can you tell us how you're going to take 5% off your budget next year um, and you can't recruit anyone until then? Uh, can you tell us how you're going to cut your uh, agency spend, how you're going to get rid of uh, contractors? And oh, by the way, for goodness sake, make sure you carry on delivering all the things you said you would and could you do these 43 things as well? I think is probably how it feels. And um, there's an extent to which, you know, acute hospitals, that, that's perhaps always what it's like and, and, and in, in other bits of the service as well. What's different is that if we aren't careful, we're already on a bit of a, uh, a downward spiral in terms of the number of vacancies and access to digital skills. And, um, you know, if, if, if us four are, are a team and one person's left and either that seat's empty, so you, know, you three are having to work harder and feel a bit cross about that, mm. or there's someone sat here who's only three times as much on a day rate because we couldn't fulfill the post permanently, it becomes frustrating for the people who are left either way, doesn't it? Mm. And then we're still trying to work out how do we save 5% and how do we deliver everything that we said we would. And so you know, th th this, isn't, this will take some uh, kind of significant effort to change the direction and to change the... Uh, you change what, a, what feels at times like um, a, a bit of a, a, downward, a downward spiral that we have to be able to break out of yeah. uh, and have to be able to draw people in uh, to, to fill those gaps. Um, and I, I think that if you go and speak to most exec teams, there's a recognition, in theory, that investing in digital is a good thing. Mm. Yeah. But the pressure from you know, region or from the national team is never have you invested in digital, it's are you going to hit your control toll? Yeah. I wonder if, um, I, I wonder if we need to change, the, change that narrative. So if I think that um, a, a board level, some of the leadership decisions are made basically, some of those are about compliance ticking. So I use this example at numerous occasions, but if you're, if you're an organization and you spend a lot of your time in tribunals, the leadership will ask whether or not HR professionals are a member of the CIPD. And if they are, no further questions. We're just having a bad year. And if they're not, well, why the hell not? We've got a problem. We need to do something about this. How are people, how are leaderships, how is the leadership understanding of digital therefore changing and what does it need to do? Because we've got, you're now, roles are critical. I think everyone understands digital roles are critical to the running of primary health and social care. So it's, it's, Without that, if it falls over, the whole hospital falls over. It's not someone doesn't get an email. It's 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 20 people die, and and that's going to ratchet. So, what are those questions being asked? Are they being asked? Should they be being asked? And we will finish. This could get a bit morbid. We'll finish on something more positive. Mm -hmm. Hang in, buckle up. But let's let's see how we get there first. So, what does anyone think about? What, what are the leadership? Are they asking the wrong questions? I mean, you know, for, to go back to my example, while you think about that. Um, the, I don't know, Chartered Institute, account, Accountants England and Wales, they, have, they existed and Enron still happened, right? Yeah. So I'm not suggesting that being a member of some sort of association is, is the answer, but what do you think those questions need to be? I think for, for me, there's this challenge which is what's, what's the most risky, an empty seat or a seat that has someone in it that's good enough? And this is the dilemma that we are finding ourselves in time and again with the demand increases that we've got on ourselves and our capacity available. So is it better to have a vacancy and wait for the right candidate with the right skills, the right values, or is it better to just get someone in quickly that can help put out the fires? And we have to, you know, it's a re everyone's health and social, across the, across the whole public sector and private sector as well, this is the dilemma that we face. And there is focus at different levels around the vacancy rate, the attrition rate, safer staffing, not as much focus on are they qualified? Mm. Have they got the values? Have they got the accreditations required to give us the assurance 
that they are in the right roles that they're going to deliver the right results for our trust. So that's okay. because there isn't a recognised profession? Yet. Yet. And okay. that's, that's one of the, the key things that has to happen. And, and in fact, we're already on that journey to at the start of that journey. So professionalising the um, digital data technology and clinical informatics workforce is a top priority mm. because once you start to um, define that profession, then and define what um, what the standard is, uh, you know what the certifications need to be, what uh, what accreditations are required, whatever. Then you know if you've got the right person in the seat. Mm. You but know, you know. Yeah, but it needs to be inclusive because it needs to yeah. draw people into it. It's not a yeah. barrier yeah. Mm. that says don't work here. It's actually another barrier. Mm. We don't need any more, but we need people to go, yeah, this is for you. You need yeah. to get involved in it. And, you know, there's different grades and tiers. Of course there are, but we want people motivated because the opposite of that isn't qualified or unqualified. The opposite of that is apathy. Yeah, mm. yeah. When it's apathy we're trying to get rid of in this space, I think. Do you yeah, I think, I think that's true. I think... Um, that there are a lot of execs on boards who've been part of the NHS for a long time, consequently have lived with um, your less than perfect digital solutions or IT for a long time and have got along, they've, they've managed, they've submitted accounts, they've um, you know, complied with whatever region or the national team have asked for each year. Um, and so tick, you know, we don't need to worry about it. I think what's really helpful and I found really useful is uh, channeling the non-execs on boards because they've almost always come from different industries or plenty of them have. There's no other industry in the world, is there, that, uh, in our country at least, that, that still sends letters to your door apart from the council and the NHS. Nobody else thinks that operating on paper is sensible. You, know, if you get your car gets stopped, you know, by, by the R you dealt with by the RSE. The, the guy's tapping away on a laptop in the front of his van with oily hands and yet we still write things in, in clinics. Um, but if you, so the non-execs have experienced a different world. They would never dream of trying to operate an organisation, in our case, you know, 8,000 people, uh, 650 million pounds on paper. They recognise that it's just the way you do business. It's got to be to digitise those processes. And so, you know, uh, channelling um, kind of their experience, their expectations and their energy in helping to change the mind of a whole board to think differently mm. about how you do things. I think is probably really important because otherwise it can be really easy just to think we've got along without taking this too seriously in the past. We'll probably get along carrying on doing that. Okay. I, d I don't know if I've destroyed the timing enough yet. Have we got time for some questions? We've got three minutes. If you, I'm going to ask the panel one last question, but has anyone got any questions? <coughs> A burning desire to talk? Yes, we have. Hello. The microphone is on its way. Hi there. Um, State I'm your name, cuz. Yes. <laughs> I'm Gemma Ramsey. I'm actually from NHS England. I work in digital pharmacy policy. Cool. Um, first of all, just a brief kind of observation, I guess, on... Actually, no. I'll just go straight into the question. We're running out of time. Um, how would we deal... Obviously, if we're trying to get bums on seats, things like equality can go out the window sometimes. So how, would, how do we deal with that, given the pressures that we've got to get those bums on seats? A diversity and inclusion essentially yeah anyone like to yeah i think it's um it's absolutely front and center of our thinking starting with equal and diverse panels as well because i'm sat here as a white almost middle-aged male in this in a leadership role and that that's a that's a barrier. It's not very inclusive unless our behaviours are inclusive. And ensuring that we are not positively discriminating and looking at the trying to address the diversity as well of the team is, is a balance as well. So we're looking for people with the right skills first and foremost, with the right values, and then obviously making sure that we're not excluding anyone unnecessarily. That is the key. To do that when there's a vacancy pressure it's actually quite easy because of, for remote working, the net is wide. We need people in. 
you don't have, even if, you, even if you're so inclined, the ability to deliberately exclude. I think the closest you would get is digital exclusion because you're looking for remote workers that have got the capability to work wherever you can across the country for an organisation. The closest you get is digital exclusion. But certainly I think for um, inclusive recruitment, I think it's probably easier as long as you're minded to do it. Can I just add? Um, I think we need to go to multiple channels to find people. It's all about the pipeline. We need, to d we need to build a diverse <coughs> pipeline, so not just focusing on universities, going to ordinary colleges and schools to find people, but then also I think we need to do better succession planning. Yeah. So we need to invest in building um, leaders, uh, a diverse sort of succession planning pipeline, I suppose. Um, uh, because I went to a conference the other day and I won't say which one it was, and it was probably about 98% white male. So we're still not there yet. We've got a heck of a long way to go. Mm. That's true. I think it's, it's really important that certainly in the private sector, the lesson has been learned quite quickly that actually the more diverse the team, the better the outcome. Yeah. So forget all the other arguments. So in a, in a, in a private environment, that's, that's the biggest lesson people to understand is because your clients and your customers and your patients will look and are different yeah. so um i think we've probably blown that can i say very quickly uh timing wise i mean um what does good look like what 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 would you like to say in a year's time let's say we sat back here what would you like to have looked back on and said right that was something i did meaningfully around sort of digital retention digital recruitment into health and social care what would you like to have seen just very quickly uh, I think some of the things that, that um, yeah, Yinka talked about, some of the, uh, if we can uh, collectively uh, help all of our uh, own informatics skills development networks and the national team to create more opportunities for uh, apprenticeships, for um, uh, you know, informatics graduate trainees, uh, opportunities to draw people in. And if we can have got to a point where somebody who never imagined going into the NHS for a career is, uh, is, is seeing adverts that are attractive and not full of kind of, you know, uh, verbiage that they can't make sense of, then that would yeah. be a win, wouldn't it? Brilliant. For, for me, the clinical professional nurses, clinicians, workforce getting into digital roles. So with, with digital upskilling of the workforce across our organisations, getting that confidence in skills, in technology, in how we digitise things without leaving people behind. We, we really take a lot of time and effort to try and digitally upskill those because we're rapidly digitising. And then turning that just confidence with the system that we've introduced or the new process we've undertaken and digitised to actually wanting to be a part of further transformation and getting some of those clinical and professional backgrounds into the digital workforce is a key one for me. Cool. Yinka, final word. We will have launched our workforce strategy uh, we will have launched um, several core competency frameworks, some of which we're working with BCS yep. on, and um, we will have started to drive up the number of apprenticeships and graduates that we're coming, getting, get, getting through. Excellent. So I think I have run out of time. I definitely have. So I'd just like you to thank the panel in the usual manner. Thank you very much. <laughs>